get that under us. And this is one first push here. And uh, for six weeks we've been praying. I hope you've been praying. Lord, which of those would you have me to take? And what it is, the number on it is how much money you say you'll put in there, and that'll go right towards debt uh, above tithe and offering. And so today, sometime, just get you an envelope. You can see several people already been getting their envelopes. You get one. If every envelope is gone and the money put in it that, of the number that's on there, that's over $11,000 that'll go straight towards debt. Every single penny of that will go straight towards debt. I'd love to get out of debt. And I believe the Lord will bless that. And then we can use that money we're sending to the bank. We can use it to help people. We can use it to get the gospel out. And uh, so let's be faithful in that. Say, well, preacher, I just, I can't, I just don't have it. Hey, that's between you and God. But I will let you know, look, as low as $1, anything can go to, you can do your part if you want to. And if you'll pray, Lord, you give me what I, you want me to put in there, and I'll put it in there. And uh, so just get it sometime today. Turn those in. You can turn them in before if you want to, but it's not for another two weeks that we set aside. This is the two weeks uh, or the week that we had take it up. And so you'd be praying about it. Grab you one of them envelopes. Each person, uh, even my 12-year-old son came in here this morning and grabbed one, that $148 one. Isn't that right, boy? No. <laughs> but uh, you'd be praying about that. Hey, if you love Jesus, say amen. Hey, there's a whole lot of people sick, all right? If you are even close to being sick, if you if you feel like you might be, if you th you're thinking about getting sick, please don't shake my hand. All right, uh, I know standing back there, sometimes at the door shaking hands, and I really need to stop watching the line as it's coming towards me, because I invariably look back and see somebody. They're about three people away, and they say, <coughs> and then they come up and and do this, or or even maybe worse. They stick their finger, uh, they're scratching their brain, if you know what I mean by that, going up that way, and then they come up to shake hands. Boy, that's nasty. Um, but, look, if you're sick, we have uh, hand sanitizer out there, man. Disinfect yourself. Uh, disinfect yourself after you shake hands. This sickness is bad. All right? there, uh, our youth pastor, Brother Barry, his little son had to be in the hospital for a couple days. Now, Brother Barry's sick. Rachel Ivy was watching some of their kids. Now she's got it. Uh, so there's people everywhere sick. I think Matthew Thompson uh, uh, is sick. Uh, there's a lot. So you be careful out there. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians. Oh, let me move this on up here. There we go. Colossians chapter 1. Everybody stand, if you would, please. We're going to read verses 12 through 14. Colossians chapter 1. We've started going through the book of Colossians here. Paul writing to the church of Colossae, the believers there hoping that they would become a, a grounded, unshakable church in their faith. So verses 12 through 14, let's read it, read it responsibly as we do. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray. Father, once again, we're grateful to be here with our church family. And Lord, we've gathered now to dig into your word. Uh, Lord, we want to be closer to you. And we want to be effective for you. And we want to live for you. So please help us to learn to do so. And then Lord, give us the strength and the courage to yield to you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Giving thanks. Praising God. If, if, as you read the Gospels, it seems to flow most naturally from Paul. It's just like breathing. It doesn't seem that it's something he had to work up. It's not forced. It's a natural part of who he is. Just praising God. Just, uh, he'll be writing this letter and all, well, let, let me read a few verses in 1 Corinthians 15, 57. He wrote to the church of Corinth. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He wrote to the church of Ephesus in Ephesians 5, 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God. In Philippians 4, 6, he wrote to the church of Philippi, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto God 
He wrote to the church of Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, In everything, give thanks. He wrote to his, his protege Timothy in 1 Timothy 2.1, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. He wrote to the Hebrews in Hebrews 13, 15, <coughs> By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Over and over in Paul's letters, we find this recurrent theme of praise and thanksgiving. Now, here's the amazing thing. Paul wrote these words from a prison cell. Everything was not bright and cheery. Many of these times, he may have just finished receiving a beating. He may have been uh, uh, just delivered from being shipwrecked and floating out in the ocean. Okay, listen, I, I need a little help this morning, okay? So don't be scared. I need a little help. Somebody named something that you, you just praise God for. Uh, 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 children. She said children, praise the Lord. I know she didn't say husband. Uh, no, I don't think. Uh, somebody else said something. Who, who said that? Who said help? Okay. Oh, back there. Okay. Help. Yes, sir. Upcoming grandbaby. Going to be a Paul Paul. Somebody help him walk to the car today. He may have a hard time getting out there. Yes, sir. Salvation. Peace. Somebody name something else that you praise God for. What's that? Family for boys? Oh, boys. <laughs> well, you're not quite old enough for that, Madison, now. I thought she, she was bold about it. I thought she was saying boys. <coughs> for her voice. She praises God for that. I don't know if many of us praise God for that. No. Somebody else, name something you praise God for. For a husband, somebody said, who said hope? Oh, by their, hope, that's good. Anybody else? Church family? Mercy? A, a job? Okay, hey, that's good. That is great. And here's what Paul's doing. He's writing to the Colossians and he's telling them, listen, I, I, I want you to be strong in the faith because opposition was coming. False teachers were sneaking into the church and perverting the truth and they were drawing attention away from Christ. Listen, Anything that draws your focus away from Christ is probably not a good teaching, all right? Christ is all in all, isn't he? Oh, I'm glad four or five of you agree with that. Now, I want you to notice something here. The vast majority of the things we praised God for, and are good things that we ought to praise God for. Okay? Ms. Batchel praised God for her husband. Ms. Fulgen praised God for her children. Some praise God for health. Some praise God for uh, a, a job. Man, those are great things. But there's one thing in common with all those things. Anybody know what it is? There's something you can lose. Now, here Paul is. I want you to think about this. Paul is in prison. To our knowledge, he, he can't praise God for a wife. But don't think he had one he can't praise God for his children as a matter of fact the Bible other than his church family his brothers and sisters we don't see anything of Paul's children so he's not praising God for that he can't praise God for that he can't necessarily praise God for his good health because we don't believe Paul had tremendously good health we, I, I don't know that we uh, Paul could praise Praise God for the abundance of friends. It seems like there were more people trying to kill him than were trying to help him. Uh, so, yet, in spite of all those things, we find Paul over and over praising God. I praise God for my wife and for my children. I, I think one of the most painful things, I've never experienced it, and it may happen one day, I, I hope not, but experiencing the loss of, of one of those that are so dear to me <coughs> but if I lose that does that mean that I can't praise God 
Paul writes to them, and he he says this in verse number uh, uh, 12, giving thanks unto the Father. And then he gives them three things that he is thankful for. And get this, these are three things that cannot be undone. These are three things that cannot be taken away. Three things that are eternal. And that is why Paul, even in prison, and look, we, it's not like the prisons we, we have nowadays. This was like a dungeon. Rats running around, muck and mire. Maybe people had used the bathroom in there, and there he is laying in it. And it's just, just a nasty, cold, dark, dank, smelly place. And yet, even in those circumstances, Paul says, listen, I'm praying for you in Colossae. I've never even met you. But you are my brothers and you are my sisters because we have the same Father. And then he says this, giving thanks. Here he is in prison. And many of the things that we named, not all, we named some things that were eternal, but many of the things we named, he didn't have. And yet Paul is thankful. And Paul praises God. Do you remember what him and Silas did at midnight when they were in prison? What did they do at midnight? They prayed and sang praises to God. Man, what a testimony. How in the world? Let me ask you this. If you were thrown into prison, innocent, into a dreadful uh, atmosphere, would your natural inclination be to thank God or would it be to be angry or to have a pity party or to shake your fist at God or even to doubt God and say boy I don't understand how God could let this happen that's how we do many times when one of the things that are that we praise God for and we're thankful for but it's something that's temporal and it's taken from us and because all our, all our eggs were placed in that basket, we forget to praise Him. We become frustrated. We become depressed. We become angry. We become bitter. We develop this hopelessness in us. I want you to notice something else about Paul. His prayer was not to be delivered from the prison, but rather that he would be able to one day stand before Caesar in Rome's highest court. Man, my prayer probably would have been, Lord, get me out of here. But that wasn't Paul's prayer. Paul's prayer was, okay, look, I'm already in prison. I'm already in Rome's judicial system. Hey, let me stand before Caesar because I want to share the gospel with him. When death came, he didn't run and hide. He welcomed it once again with praise and thanksgiving. How did he do that? We see it over and over in the face of imprisonment, beatings, stonings, shipwrecks, slander, and on and on. Paul continued to be thankful and had this this praise that just naturally emanated from him. In the face of hardships, hunger, thirst, being on the run for his life, fears, betrayals. How could Paul so readily praise God? For what was for what was Paul so thankful? Let me give you a few things. Look in verse number 12. <clears throat> Giving thanks unto the Father, now look at this, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Paul said, the first thing I'm thankful for is this right here. For being remade. Now stick with me here. I'm thankful for being remade. Paul knew that he had been a sinful man. In 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul remembers who he was before he met Christ. Do, Do you remember who you were before you met Christ? Listen to what he says. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. 
that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now wait, listen. Of whom I am chief. Paul said, man, I'm so thankful because I remember what I was before I met Christ. He said, I know that Christ came and he came here not to save good people. He came here because we were not good. And he came here to save sinners. And I want to tell you something, believers in Colossae, of all the sinners he came to save, Paul said, I was the worst one. Paul was responsible for the death of Christians before he became a Christian. Paul was responsible for the imprisonment of Christians. Paul was responsible for the heartbreak in many families as they saw mom and dad dragged off the prisoner, as they saw mom or dad stoned to death. Paul was responsible for that. In Romans 7, 18, Paul says this about himself. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Paul said, look, in and of myself, there's not one good thing about me. Let me tell you something. Without Christ, every one of us are lost sinners without hope. Christ is all that makes a difference. Unity Baptist Church is none of our salvation. It is Jesus Christ and Him alone. Let me say this. Unity Baptist Church cannot fix you or me. Only Jesus Christ can. Now, He uses the church as a tool to help us out, but it's only Jesus that makes that difference. Amen? Isaiah 64, 6 says this about us, but we all, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Paul's remembering who he was before he met Christ. He said, Man, I was I was the worst of sinners. There's not a good thing in me. Do you remember who you were before you met Christ? A sinner lost, no hope of heaven, no hope of eternity. The only only sure thing was that when we died, we were going to hell. But then we met Christ. Listen, God starts his work in us by making us. That term there is only used here and in 2 Corinthians 3, 6 where it says, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. It literally means, when he's talking about being made, uh, let, let me read that again, who, giving thanks unto God the Father, which hath made us to be partakers of the inheritance. It literally means to make sufficient or to render fit. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Our sin had disqualified us from being partakers of the, of the inheritance. But Christ qualifies us. Look, I... You can come to church every time the doors are open, and when they're not open, you can break them down and come anyways. You can be baptized till the tadpoles know your social security number. You can uh, uh, do all kinds of good things. You can carry around a family Bible instead of a big one. You can do all these good things, but listen, that does not qualify you to be a child of God. Only Christ does. And Paul, he says, boy, I, I give thanks. And he's teaching the Colossians, the, the uh, believers in Colossae something. Here He said, here's why I give thanks. Because God made me someone who is unworthy, someone who is unfit, someone who is unqualified to be a child of God. There's nothing I could do of my own to be a child of God. Jesus Christ 
He qualified me. He made me fit. It talks about the inheritance. Peter refers to this inheritance as something that is incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away. Listen, the temporal things we praise God for and nothing wrong with that, we ought to be thankful and praise God for them. Those things, however, will, will fade away. They'll be corrupted with age, but not our eternity in heaven, this inheritance. The inheritance of the saints in light is what he says right there. It's literally in the light. Throughout the, the New Testament, Paul, Paul's use of light is descriptive of God and his presence. It is the absolute opposite of darkness. So here's what he's saying. God has made me fit to dwell in his presence for eternity. Anybody out there? Okay, let's, here's what he, okay, let me come down here and break it down. Paul said, basically, I was a rotten, low-down, filthy, corrupt, scummy sinner on my way to hell. With no hope, no chance, no way to get to heaven. But then I met someone by the name of Jesus. And he became, for me, when he hung on that cross, he became the dirty, rotten, low-down, despicable, scummy sinner. And he, through his death, burial, and resurrection, when I placed my faith on him, he became the sin for me so that I could become his righteousness. He said he switched places with me. He said, boy, I'm so thankful because I remember I, I was a religious man, but I was a sinner, and I, I had no hope of heaven, but Christ made me worthy. Listen, if you have trusted Christ as your Savior, you need to realize who you are. If you have trusted Christ in, as your Savior, you look. You may sin, but you're no longer a sinner. You are a saint. You have been made a child of God. You have been made, the, made righteous in the sight of God. He goes on here. In, in our glorified bodies, we who were once lost, in sin and slaves to darkness will be equipped, we are equipped to stand in the presence of his glory. We will get to stand in the presence of a holy God one day. Is that a good thing, folks? Okay, well, don't be scared to grunt or something. Hey, did Carolina win their basketball game last night? I thought that might get some cheering out of somebody. I thought maybe it's more interesting than that than Jesus. I wasn't sure. Hey, now look, verse 13. Here's the second thing that Paul was thankful for. First thing is he, he remade me from a sinner. He made me his child. Now look at verse 13. Here's the next thing. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Okay. Boy, this is good. So first he said, I'm thankful that I've been remade. Now he's saying, I'm thankful because I've been rescued. On the cross, in dying, Jesus Christ rescued me. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57, listen to this. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us the, what? Victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, man, I was lost in sin, but he rescued me and hath translated us. Now get this, that word translated, it means 
to move from one place to another. It gives the, the picture of an eastern ruler who would uproot his vanquished enemies and carry them away to another place, much like the Babylonians did with Israel and when Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were there. The Babylonians came in and they, they ransacked Jerusalem and they took a lot of people captive and, and instead of killing everybody, they took men like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, others that were expert in some areas or others that were very wise. They took them and they took them back to their own country of Babylon and they educated them there and integrated them. They made them Babylonian citizens. Paul says here, I've been delivered. I've been translated. He said, I was on my way to hell, but Jesus Christ came and he saved me and he made me. I'm no longer a child of the devil. I'm a child of God. I am a citizen of another country now. That's heaven. And not only am I a citizen, but I am joint heirs with the Son of God. This is what God has done. He's removed us from Satan's darkness and placed us in his own kingdom. I am one of his citizens. I'm one of his children. In Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. Paul said, look, he, he remade me, but then he rescued me. There was nothing I could do on my own. He threw out the lifeline, so to speak, and he dragged me out of certain hell. By the way, once he remakes you, you become his child. That is something that is undoable. It is undoable. My son Carson here, who just woke up, my son, he wasn't asleep. He was about to, though. My son Carson, let's say he gets older, and he, he says, Dad, I'm sick and tired of you mentioning my name from the pulpit. And I'm, I'm, I'm out of here, man. I'm leaving. I'm going to China. They have good food there, by the way. I'm going to China, and you're not my dad anymore. Oh, that'd be heartbreaking. Here's the thing, son. My blood flows through your veins. There's nothing you can do to change it. You are stuck. I've been made his child. That's something that can't be taken away from me. Throw me in a prison, I'm still his. Persecute me, I will not enjoy it one bit. I'm allergic to pain. It makes me break out in tears. But you persecute me. I'm still his. You can't change that. Take away my house. Take away my family. That, look, that would hurt. That would be devastating. But I'm still his. I've been remade. I've been rescued. Look, do what you want to. I can't go to hell now. I've been rescued. I'm on my way to heaven. Hey, here's the last thing. Verse number 14, all right, read it here with me, look at it with me. Verse 14, so first remade, he said, I'm so thankful I've been remade. I'm so thankful I've been rescued. Now look at verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Paul said, here's, here's what else I'm thankful for. I've been redeemed. Look, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you have been remade, you have been rescued, you have been redeemed. You're a child of God, and that ought to shape every area of your life. Redemption. It means the liberation obtained by the payment of a ransom. We see this in the book of Hosea, the Old Testament. Hosea was a prophet. God would use the prophets many times and things in their life as a picture to Israel. And God goes to Hosea and he said, Hosea, look, I want to use you as a picture of my love for my people. I want you to get married, Hosea. 
Oh, my, yeah, that's great. All right. I want you to get married to a prostitute. That's a picture of how the children of Israel were. They were corrupt. They had defiled themselves. He said, Hosea, I want you to marry a harlot. So Hosea did. In spite of her imperfections and in spite of her shortcomings, Hosea loved her. And then she left. She just left. They had some children. She left him. She went back to her old life. Hosea is out and about one day in the city. And he sees his wife who had left him and the children being sold as a slave who would most likely be used as a prostitute once again. Hosea steps up in the crowd as they're taking bids for this, this lady who had defiled herself and who had done so wickedly. They're taking bids and Hosea raises his hand. He begins to bid. Others bid against him and he bids and his wife just looks at him. Why is he doing this? Why would he want me back? Well, I was horrible when he found me. I treated him horribly afterwards. I left him and my children. I've gone out and done more wicked things than Hosea. He continues to bid until he ends the bid. takes her back home and he loves her again. He redeemed her. He set her free. He purchased her back to himself. Paul said, I'm so grateful because that's what Christ did for me. He came for me not because I was good but because I was wicked. I was lost in my sin. And he purchased me with his own blood. He purchased my freedom with his own blood. The thousands of sacrifices in the Old Testament times, the rivers of blood that was shed could not redeem the people of God from their sin. It could not, it wasn't priceless enough to purchase them to God. Paul had called those things, those feast days and those, those uh, 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 sacrifices, he called them a shadow of things to come. They were, they were a shadow of the, of the coming Christ. Listen, the shadow of, key, of a key cannot set a prisoner free. The shadow of a meal cannot feed a hungry man. And the shadow of Calvary, which is what those other things were, those Old Testament sacrifices, they could not redeem a sinful man. And so Jesus Christ, the living Son of God, came and shed His blood for us to purchase us, a sinful people, back to Himself. Hebrews 9, 12, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by His own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now look what it goes on to say. Even, get this, the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins, we speak of that so casually. We don't really think about it, what it really means. Oh, well, hey, I, I, you know, I'm forgiven. We say it flippantly and casually. But think about the burden of sin and guilt. Many people with physical ailments and even mental and emotional ailments, a lot of that has to do with this thing called guilt. Secular psychologists, they have no answer to the problem of guilt except to shift the blame to someone else. Well, you're doing this because your parents did such and such. You're doing this because your mom or your dad did. You're doing this because of your children. You're doing this because of work. And, and, and they shift the blame. But let me tell you something. They're not far off the mark, for that's exactly what God did. He shifted our guilt, every bit of it, 
to someone else. Jesus Christ. Leviticus 4, when Moses is writing about the sacrifices, he speaks of this a place called the clean place where the ashes of the Old Testament were poured out. They had offered that sacrifice and they had taken the, the ashes from that sacrifice and they had take it to the clean place and they had dump out those ashes. Ashes, ashes show us that the fire has done its work. The sacrifice had been completely consumed. Now a hot ember can be stirred again, right? Into a flame. Anybody here ever heat with fire or heat with a wood stove or anything? You know, you pile it full of wood at night and the next day you go in there and you open it back up and you stoke them hot embers, throw some more wood on it and it becomes a fire again. But you can't do that with just ashes. Ashes cannot be made to burn again. It's done. And such is God's forgiveness. Listen to what this man named John Phillips said. Our guilt, once dealt with at Calvary, is as dead as the ashes of the sin offering. Dead. Our guilt is dead. Our guilt is utterly dead. Never again to be rekindled into tormenting, consuming flame. As a child of God, those things in my past, they are in my past. And though I was guilty then, I'm guilty no longer. My guilt has been burned. My guilt is dead. I am totally forgiven. No, no, hey, the Lord's not going to say to me now, hey, Ronnie, remember that time when you was a young man and you used some language you shouldn't have used? No, I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. He, he, he's not going to hold over your head the time you got drunk or the time you got high, the time you did something that you shouldn't have done, that bad decision you made and, and that bad choice you made. No, once it's under the blood, look, that is forgiven, so stop carrying it around with you. Well, I could, I could just never, I just can't serve God because of all that in my past. No, listen, when he forgives, that guilt is gone. Paul was guilty of death of Christians. Now he's writing from a prison and he says, boy, I, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful. Why are you thankful, Paul? You're in a prison. Yeah, but I know who I am. I know who I am in Christ. I'm one that has been remade. I'm a child of God. I'm one that is redeemed. I've been purchased back uh, by the blood of Christ. I'm one that has been rescued. And it shaped Paul's whole life. And I really believe that's why in every letter he writes, you find him talking about praising God and giving God thanks. Because he knew as bad as it is, yeah, I've been shipwrecked. I've been floating a night and a day in the ocean. I, I've been beaten with rods. I've been beaten with whips. I've been thrown into prison. I, I, I've been stoned and left for dead. Praise God. Why praise God, Paul? Because there's one thing they can't take away. He is mine. I'm his. Paul's prayer was that his fellow believers would live in the victory and strength that are found in God. It was also that they would live lives grateful for being remade and rescued and redeemed. Let me ask you something. Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? There's nothing complicated about that. He did all the complex stuff only way to heaven there's got to be a time where you realize man I'm a sinner on my way to hell and I need a savior and at that time with all your heart you call on the Lord Jesus Christ placing your faith in him and listen at that moment boom you become his child he rescues you he says you're no longer on your way to hell he redeems you you no longer belong to darkness and to sin and to the devil you belong to me now I've purchased you with the blood of Jesus Christ have you done that?
Have you trusted Christ? Say, yeah, preacher, I have. Okay, then why? Why do we continue to live as slaves to sin, guilt, and death when we've been made righteous? Why do we continue to live under the guilt that has already been taken for us? Why do we carry, or why do we live as slaves when we've been set free? A child of God. And Paul, once again, he's writing to the Colossians. He's teaching them some things. Hey, realizing these things and holding on to these things will help you be unshakable. When that false teacher comes along, you'll know, no, that's not right. And when a hard time comes along, it's not going to blow you off course. Why? Because you know you're a child of God. We have been made a child of God. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, we have been rescued from sin, guilt, death, darkness, and on and on. And if you've trusted Christ as Savior, we've been purchased and made not only citizens of his kingdom, but joint heirs with Jesus Christ. So listen, church, let's live in that victory, clinging desperately and hopelessly to our Savior, Jesus Christ. You can bow your head and close your eyes, please. Father, I want to thank you. This world, as 